University of Toronto faculty, staff, and students, and our alumni have created and are in the process of creating hundreds of companies, thousands of jobs, and even entirely new industries. They are innovators par excellence. And so we wanted to introduce you to some of our brightest entrepreneurial stars tonight. It's a chance to hear directly from them about how innovation happens at U of T and to learn about just a few of the ways that U of T entrepreneurs are contributing to greater economic and social prosperity here at home and around the globe. Cynthia Goh, professor in the Department of Chemistry and director of U of T's Impact Center. Alumnus Darren Anderson is the chief technology officer at Vive Crop Protection Incorporated, a company that has grown to 30 full-time employees in two centers in Toronto and one in Guelph. Stuart Aitchison is the Nortel Chair in Emerging Technology in our Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. PhD student James Doe is the Chief Technology Officer at ChipCare, a company he co-founded with his research advisor, Professor Aitchison. Ajay Agrawal is the Peter Monk Professor of Entrepreneurship at the Rotman School of Management and founder of the Creative Destruction Lab at the Rotman School. And alumnus Carl Martin is president, CEO, and co-founder of Bionem, a new startup that has worked closely with the Creative Destruction Lab. So now on to our conversation. Innovation is about bringing brilliant and socially relevant ideas to the marketplace. At U of T, student and faculty collaboration often drives this process. ChipCare Corporation, founded by Stuart Aitchison and James Doe, is a great example. They worked along with their collaborator, Rakesh Nayar. ChipCare has developed a handheld blood testing device that can provide almost instant disease diagnoses. This mobile lab on a chip has the potential to save and improve the lives of millions of people around the world by providing state-of-the-art blood testing to patients in remote areas. The project won the U of T Inventor of the Year Award in 2012. It was profiled in the Better World Report in 2011. It won the Canadian Business Magazine Innovation Award in 2010. And it was part of Premier Wynn's trade mission to China just last month. James, let me start with you. Maybe you can tell us more about your device. How does it work and what impact do you hope that it will have? So uh, our device, it's got two components. I wish I brought my prototype with me today. But uh, it's got two components. It's got a handheld analyzer and a disposable cartridge. And the way it works is very similar to the glucose meter that you see on the market. You, the workflow is very similar. You do a pinprick on a patient. You get a droplet of blood sample onto the cartridge. You put it into the analyzer, and you get the results in 10, 15 minutes. The device has also got communication capability so that you can upload the data, the results, to a cloud database that can enable doctors and physicians to remotely monitor patients. The healthcare system administrators can have access to all the data. And this, our vision is really to bring the testing to the patient instead of asking patients to travel thousands of kilometers to a central lab for the blood testing and really lower the burden on healthcare system and reduce the access to state-of-the-art blood testing diagnosis. So I understand you began working on this device when you were a master's student, is that correct? That's right. So, and you were working under Stuart's supervision. Are you surprised that just a few years later you've launched a company? Yes, absolutely. I guess the whole thing started, when I, when I started, I never thought about starting a company. And at the end of the master's, we wanted to explore the commercial sort of potential of this technology. We talked to many different people, people with different backgrounds, clinicians, scientists, hospital administrators. And gradually the idea became evolving and in 2009, ChipCare was born. Fantastic. Stuart, can you tell us a little bit about how this collaboration actually got started and at what point you knew that you had a viable technology to bring to the market? Well, I think we'd been working on the technology for a number of years 
but I guess it was when James, myself, we met uh, Casey Nair, our co-founder, that we really cemented with us the application of the technology where we can take a drop of blood on a disposable cartridge and get the same results from a $100,000 instrument in a central lab. And the implications of that, for taking the testing to the patient, were huge, particularly in remote and developing countries where patients may not have any access to healthcare. Fantastic. I'd love to ask many more questions, but I think we're going to move on. Thank you so much. Let's move to our second case study. So over the last decade, the university has made very significant progress towards creating an ecosystem for entrepreneurial activity among our faculty and students. Across our three campuses, you can now find accelerators and programs that are designed to harness entrepreneurial energy and to create clearer pathways to commercialization. The Creative Destruction Lab at the Rotman School of Management, founded by Peter Monk, Professor of Entrepreneurship, Ajay Agrawal, is one prominent example. Recently, the lab played a significant role in helping BioNIM's Carl Martin launch NIMI, a biometric wristband, uses your unique cardiac rhythm to authenticate your identity and unlock a range of devices such as your computer, your smartphone, or even your car. Recently covered in the New York Times, The Economist, and Wired, the NIMI has the potential to be a game changer in the world of digital security and privacy. So Carl, you've created um, this amazing product and company. You've credited the Creative Destruction Lab with helping you get NIMI off the ground. You already had a company and a great idea. So how did the lab help you take things to the next level? So yeah. Um the company existed for one and a half years prior to us joining the lab, and we consider ourselves uh, a U of T spin-off. Um, but that, that first one and a half years, it was very slow, but it, it was a very sort of early uh, discovery phase where we were taking the technology out of the lab and exploring a lot of different opportunities around it, making some progress in our thinking. But the business itself, from every outward view, did not, uh, did not make significant progress. Um, so it was about one and a half years in, we did join the lab, and we had a very pivotal moment uh, when we were in the lab, which was taking us out of our mindset, to, which was really very much a scientist mindset of, you know, what, what's the direct application for the technology, to, well, how can you actually create massive value out of it, right? Go from just application, but building business where uh, there's a lot of value associated with all the activities around that. And so we, we went from this technology focus to product focus to, to market business focus. And so up to that point, we were never more than three people. And then we, we made this pivot to, to make this product out of the technology that we had. And um, so that was one and a half years ago, and now we're 40 people. So obviously, there, you can, if you chart our path, there's a very discreet yeah. moment in our history. I've had the pleasure of sitting in on some of the, the G7 sessions at the, at the lab. It must be intimidating to face that, uh, that group of uh, experienced entrepreneurs. Um, I, it was initially. I can say I, I believe I had a personal transformation at the same time, which is, um, you know, going from that mindset of trying to prove yourself, trying to say this does have value to, wait a minute, there's this sort of wealth of experience and how do I tap into this and, and get the most out of it. Um, so it was definitely that transformative experience. So Ajay, um, there is skepticism in certain quarters about the ability of universities to teach entrepreneurial capacity. Uh, what do you make of this skepticism? Can, in fact, one teach entrepreneurial capability and develop it in our students? And how do you think the Creative Destruction Lab contributes to that goal? Sure. So, um, first off, yes, there is great skepticism. And I would say that um, we, what we've done at the lab is, is, I think the innovation at the lab is actually an innovation in market design. That is to say, uh, when we ask the question, why do so many university entrepreneurs fail? And that's not a U of T problem. That is an OECD country problem. Basically, everywhere outside of Silicon Valley uh, faces this problem in, at, uh, to quite a significant extent. 
Our conclusion, our thesis was that the reason for failure, you have so many smart people doing masters, PhDs, and postdocs, uh, they're at the very frontier of their field, they have passion, they have drive, they have chutzpah, they have everything that entrepreneurs are supposed to have, why are they failing uh, at such high frequency rates? And our thesis was, is because they don't have judgment. Uh, in other words, by judgment, they wake up in the morning, there's a thousand things they could do to advance their business, and they don't know out of those thousand things which are the two or three things to focus on. And yet, in every major city like Toronto or Boston or Philadelphia, there are people in the city that have that judgment. Uh, and yet, there's no link between the people that have it. So, you know, a 28-year-old person that's invented something that has a potential, uh, you know, market, uh, a product that, that could be um, commercialized, and the people with judgment that know how to do that. And so the design of the lab was designed to solve the failure in the market for judgment. And so uh, I won't go through the details, uh, but I'm happy to take them if there's questions if there's an interest. But the key aspect was working on solving that market failure. And I should point out that while many universities have accelerators and, and uh, incubators and so on, that I think it shouldn't be lost that although we're getting a lot of attention these days because you know accelerators are uh, fashionable, that this is only possible to do because we are in the company of a first-class research institution. In other words, this is not 19-year-olds in their dorm rooms writing software anymore. You know, that was, that was uh, where this was, you know, f maybe 10 years ago. But companies like Carl, you know, Carl had uh, seven or eight years, and his co-founder both, of graduate-level research uh, before they arrived to our lab, and, and same, I think you'll hear from Cynthia. And so I think, you know, version 1.0 of accelerators was 90-year-olds in their dorm rooms, but where we are now is uh, at the frontier where there are, you know, we're really taking advantage of the fact that we have world-class faculty and PhD and postdocs. That's a great point. Well, thank you. We will uh, move on and may come back if there is time. So the Impact Center is another leading accelerator at U of T. It's located in our Banting and Best Center on College Street, just across from Mars. Its purpose is to convert revolutionary knowledge developed through university research, exactly the kind of research that Ajay was just talking about, and to convert it into products that benefit society. Vive Crop Protection is a company founded by Cynthia Goh with Darren Anderson and other students and it's developing crop protection products that help grow food more efficiently and with less impact on the environment. Darren, I understand, credits Cynthia's Entrepreneurship 101 course with inspiring him to start his career as a science-based entrepreneur. So Darren, let me turn to you. The world's population continues to grow. Food security has become a huge global issue. Can you explain how your technology will actually help address this challenge? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. So crop protection products are really critical to producing the food that the planet needs. Um, if a farmer doesn't have a product that can help control weeds or insect pests or diseases that are basically going to destroy his crop, he could use, lose 50% or more of his or her yields. But there are problems with current crop protection products. And, and one of the main ones is that a lot of what's applied is, is wasted. Um, that's bad economically. Um, obviously, a, a farmer doesn't want to pay for a product that doesn't provide value. Um, but it's also bad from an environmental point of view. And so what we've developed is a technology that allows us to really precisely target the crop protection product so that it goes to exactly where it needs to go to um, and, and has the control at that place. Um, this does a few things. It means that less of the product needs to be applied, uh, which increases um, grower profits. Um, it also obviously has improved environmental uh, impact, um, but in addition to that, it can increase yields. Fantastic. So it's impressive that also in your case, Five Crop began when you were a student. And so what gave you the confidence to take this big step and pursue this? Uh, that, that's a great question. So as you mentioned, I, I originally participated in uh, Entrepreneurship 101 through uh, that Cynthia uh, organized. Um, she actually referred to me the other day as, as one of her first experiments. Um, 
which is accurate. Um, and, and the mentorship that I had access to coming through that program was really critical to our company's success. I had breakfast meetings with people that I met through that program you know, once a week for the first couple of years when the company was getting started. Um, the second aspect is we had a great team. Uh, Cynthia and I are only two of the six co-founders. Um, the other are also all either University of Toronto staff or alumni. Um, and, and having that team was really critical to our early success. Uh, and last, I guess I'd say, you know, when I, when I talk to students, I say students have, uh, and this is a little bit to uh, Ajay's point, students have an interesting combination of uh, arrogance and humility. Um, they have the arrogance of youth. They believe that they're going to be able to change the world kind of regardless of the odds that are against them. Um, but they have the humility that comes from being at a university like this in a learning environment where they've really been training uh, for most of, most of their lives. Um, and so I think the combination of those two things really does give student entrepreneurs a, a real chance to be successful, assuming that they have access to the mentorship and, and judgment um, that, that programs that the university is offering uh, can really provide. Fantastic. Cynthia, let me turn to you. You've said that university researchers are discovering amazing things, but there's often a big gap to overcome before those amazing things become something of commercial value to society. So how are we closing that gap and how does the work of the Impact Center advance that particular agenda? Um, well, you know, when I came to U of T, I was a researcher. I've never done any commercialization. And I tried to understand why my papers that are highly cited are not making the impact that I want them to make. And I really wanted to, I, I love science and I want it to benefit the world, but it's not happening. And it finally hit me that what we create from our research is knowledge. And knowledge is not what you use. What you use is a product or a service. And so there is this gap uh, that needs to be addressed. And about 15 years ago, I had this epiphany that the university is full of amazing human resources. We have all these amazing students, and in fact, I'm still at U of T because I believe we have the best students in the world. And so by giving the students a little bit of training beyond their uh, foundational academic knowledge, we can make them engage in that translation from knowledge to something that the world needs. And so that, and, and that was the origin of Entrepreneurship 101. And then many years later, I created a program called Techno, which is to make it even firmer mm -hmm. that the students can build companies. So can I pick up on that point? Because you've, you've said a lot about the importance of pushing students to take risks. What else can we do to sort of nudge them along in that direction, in your view? Well, the students need to be nudged by having somebody behind them and lowering a little bit the barrier for them. Uh, particularly our, our excellent students, they probably have had scholarships all their lives. Uh, the, certainly the science students I deal with, when they finish, uh, they end up with a good job offer. Um, so they're not quite as prone to taking risks. So we, what we really do in our unit is try to make it sound less risky by the fact that we are there. Uh, it would be great if there were scholarships for them to actually uh, enable to eat while they're trying to build their technology. <laughs> uh, it's true, that's, that's all my unit does. We ha we're famous for having great cookies. We feed our entrepreneurs. <laughs> so this is uh, your, your risk support <laughs> system. <laughs> Um, but many times the student would basically come to my colleagues and I saying, I have this plan, I have this plan, what do you think? And really many times we're doing primarily encouraging, yes, you can take the risk, it's okay, we're, we're behind you yeah. all the way. Fantastic. Stuart, can I come back to you for a second? Uh, Chip Care received one of the largest social angel investments in Canadian healthcare. Uh, so how were you able to achieve this, and, and how do you think we can encourage more angel investors to support innovative startups like Chipcare? Yeah, uh, excellent question, and it took uh, many years of uh, working, per developing the product, developing the idea, and many times it was two steps forward, three steps back. But I think partnerships were the key to our success, and 
the funding was really a partnership. It was my first master's student at University of Toronto, Adrian Shower, had gone left, worked for Rogers, worked for a number, set up his own company, and uh, he had then reconnected with us when he set up a, the Julian and Adrian Shower Foundation for Africa, and through them, they became the lead investor in the chip care project, brought on Maple Leaf Angels, and brought on other, other investors. So the key thing, I think, is developing partnerships that pull together the funding resource mm -hmm. that we need to, to move forward. So has this got under your skin now? Is this something that you were likely to try and repeat in the future? Well, this is number four. Number four. So, yes. You're already a serial entrepreneur. Brilliant. I wanted to come back to Ajay's point about uh, the importance of the strength of a research university in enabling the kinds of things that we're talking about this evening to actually take place. Do you want to sort of build on that point a little bit more, maybe making comparisons to other similar institutions and what you see as the potential here at U of T? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so first off, are, are the two schools that we compare or focus on are MIT and Stanford. They are the best at doing what we are setting out to do. They are both uh, incredible research institutions and in, because of our focus on applied, you know, on, on um, con commercializing university research, we're predominantly focused on engineering department and the computer science uh, department. Uh, and then to some extent the medical school. The, um, I think, I think, you know, the, there is an incredible boundary at around most campuses and it's, and it's striking even in a downtown campus like ours, how rarely the university and downtown interact. So when I was, when I mentioned that, the, you know, our, in, what we've done at the lab is not really teaching entrepreneurship, is we've designed a, a market that br basically creates an, an environment for uh, what we call the G7. These are, are seven of Canada's most successful technology entrepreneurs that come in and will sit with uh, folks like Carl to help them take their technology from, we, th we call it from the academy into the economy. And there's over a, a billion dollars in personal net worth when those seven sit around the table. And I think, you know, what makes them interested is the caliber of the research that's happening here. In other words, you know, they're not going to go to a lot of other places. They will want to come here because of what's happening here. And, and so, but the, the trick is, I think, creating a culture where that um, type of very, fo they want to come here and waste their time. They don't want to be talking to people who aren't uh, of, of sort of, of the mindset that they want to really do something of very, you know, of, of real significance. And so by tr taking a variety of steps to lower the cost for them to, uh, in terms of the hurdles of, of, of spending time here and of making it um, feasible for, for fo folks like Carl to interact with them is, is the, uh, the way we do it. But the basis of all of it is uh, high caliber research. Fantastic. <clears throat> and it's interesting to note that, I mean, we've got representatives here from three different units of the university, the Rotman School, Electrical and Computer Engineering, Chemistry, three globally ranked departments, all fantastic. So what is it about chemistry, Cynthia? I mean, one of the things I learned as Dean of Arts and Science is that chemistry is one of the most entrepreneurial departments at the university. What's going on there? Well, um Part of it, I think, is that chemistry really is um, the basis of everything. <laughs> <laughs> we are all made of molecules. Everything is made of molecules. But the other part is really a snowball effect. I remember when Darren started uh, Vive, a time it's called Northern Nanotechnologies. And when, he's, when people started seeing what he could do, the other students said, well, if he could do it, I could do it too, can't I? And so once you start this happening, once you start breaking the, that barrier, and people are saying that it can be done. And so then our very first cohort of techno was um, six uh, chemistry uh, teams building companies. And that's what we expect to see as now um, our unit has 70, seven zero little startup companies. And we are now approached by students all the time to say, oh, I saw this, this student building a company, can you help me too? 
and I think we will see more and more because Fantastic. of that snowball. It's a great story. So I look forward to the next iteration of this panel when we'll hear about even more successes. But at, at this point, I'm afraid we have come to the end of our allotted time. So let me thank our panelists, Cynthia Go, Darren Anderson, <laughs> Stuart Aitchison, James Doe, Ajay Agarwal, and Carl Martin. Thank you.